Did you know that in the United States, seven SSRI prescriptions are written every second? That's right. These medications have become a go-to for treating depression and anxiety disorders. But with so many options available, how do you know which one to choose? Well, in this video, we'll explore the world of SSRIs and dive into the science behind these medications, uncover their unique benefits, and discuss their potential drawbacks. Whether you're new to the world of antidepressants or just looking to learn more, you've come to the right place, my friend. All right, so when we're talking about SSRIs, we're looking at six main medications. These include fluoxetine, which is Prozac, sertraline, which is Zoloft, paroxetine, which is Paxil, fluvoxamine, which is Luvox, citalopram, which is Celexa, and escitalopram, which is Lexapro. And something that you should know is that all of these different medications are off patent, meaning that generic versions are available and are generally more affordable. So if you're prescribed an SSRI, you have options when it comes to choosing a medication that fits your budget. Now, how do the SSRIs work? So SSRI is short for Selective Serotonin Reuptake Inhibitor. And as its name suggests, this class of medications works by selectively blocking the reuptake of serotonin at the neuronal level. And what this means is that more serotonin stays in the synapse between the nerve cells. Now remember, serotonin is a neurotransmitter, which is basically a chemical messenger that carries signals between nerve cells. And it's often known as the feel good or the happy chemical of the brain because it plays a key role in regulating mood, emotions, and social behavior. So when we have an increase in serotonin in the brain, this can help alleviate symptoms of depression and anxiety. Now, this is just the basic idea behind how we think antidepressants work. And scientists have found that they work on the brain in several other different ways as well, okay? I don't wanna to get too much into the science of this because it's confusing and should be a video of its own. But I know my anti-psychiatry viewers out there who like to troll me will call me out if I don't bring this up, okay? At the end of the day, the exact mechanisms of SSRIs is still being studied, and it's been suggested that they can also do things such as modify gene expression, increase BDNF production, affect neuroplasticity, and affect other neurotransmitters outside of just serotonin. All of these factors taken together are thought to contribute to their efficacy in treating depression and anxiety. Now, if all these medications work in a similar way, why do certain people experience a therapeutic response to one SSRI and not to others? And why do some patients tolerate certain medications better than others? Although they all share the common feature of serotonin transporter inhibition, each medication has unique secondary pharmacological actions. And this is important because research suggests that these secondary binding profiles may explain the differences in how effective and tolerable individual SSRIs are for patients, okay? These secondary actions can vary widely between medications and can affect how they interact with other neurotransmitters and receptors in the brain. So let's dive into each individual SSRI. I'm gonna start with the oldest ones first and work our way up to the newest ones. But before I do, I just wanna let you know that I created an antidepressant beginner's guide to help you keep track of all these medications. Not only do I talk about the SSRIs, but also the SNRIs and other medications commonly used to treat psychiatric disorders. So make sure to check it out. The link is in the description below. Okay, the first medication we're gonna talk about is fluoxetine, which is Prozac. So for each medication, I'm gonna first show you its pharmacological profile and talk about what makes it unique. Then we'll jump into the pros and cons of the medication and highlight the main things that sets it apart from the others. So when looking at the pharmacological profile of fluoxetine, what sets this medication apart is that in addition to serotonin reuptake, it also blocks 5-HT2C and the reuptake of norepinephrine. When we block 5-HT2C, this enhances the release of both dopamine and norepinephrine. So this combined with its ability to block the reuptake of norepinephrine leads to more norepinephrine and dopamine available within the brain. So what does this mean clinically? This means that fluoxetine can cause an activating effect in people. Even after the first dose, some patients will tell me that they feel more energized and less fatigued. They might be more motivated and better able to concentrate. But this isn't always a good thing for all people, right? Some people, instead of getting that energy boosting effect, might instead experience agitation, insomnia, or increased anxiety. And what's important to realize is that even though fluoxetine has these norepinephrine properties, it's still way more potent on serotonin, okay? 
This medication has been shown to be 200 times more selective in blocking the reuptake of serotonin than norepinephrine. Okay, what else sets fluoxetine apart? Fluoxetine is unique in that it's one of two SSRIs that has an active metabolite. So when your body breaks fluoxetine down, it breaks it down into several different metabolites, one being norfluoxetine. And norfluoxetine is the active metabolite, meaning that it can have an effect on the brain's neurotransmitter levels and can contribute to the overall therapeutic effect of the medication. Now, the reason this matters is because fluoxetine has a long half-life of around two to three days, but hear me out, okay? Norfluoxetine's half-life is even longer and it's estimated to be around one to two weeks. So what this means is that the medication will stay in your body for long periods of time and can continue to affect the brain even after you stop taking the medication. So if you happen to forget to take your medication one day, odds are you'll be just fine, okay? This is my go-to medication for people who struggle with remembering to take their medications because fluoxetine is the most forgiving and drug levels should remain relatively stable if you were to miss a dose. This is also advantageous when you go to discontinue the medication. Its long half-life helps reduce the potential for withdrawal reactions. And this medication has the lowest risk of all the SSRIs of causing discontinuation syndrome. The downside though of all of this is that it takes a long time to fully clear the medication from your system after stopping taking it. Some other quick benefits about fluoxetine is that it's the least likely of the SSRIs to cause weight gain. It's actually also the only FDA approved SSRI for bulimia nervosa. Another interesting fact is that it's one of the two SSRIs approved for the use in children with depression and arguably the best studied one for sure. Fluoxetine is approved down to the age of eight, where escitalopram is approved down to the age of 12. Now, a reason to potentially avoid fluoxetine is its drug-drug interactions. It's a potent inhibitor of CYP2D6 and 2C19. What this means is that it can raise the levels of many medications, some common ones being propranolol, aripiprazole, risperidone, and bupropion. It can also make some medications less effective, most notably tramadol and hydrocodone. So just be mindful of that. SSRI number two to talk about is sertraline, which is Zoloft. As you can see, its pharmacological profile is quite different than fluoxetine. In addition to serotonin reuptake inhibition, sertraline also blocks the reuptake of dopamine and binds to sigma-1 receptors. The dopamine enhancing effects are relatively small compared to that of serotonin. However, it's suspected that it might be enough to improve things such as energy, concentration, and motivation. The sigma-1 effects aren't overly well understood, but some people have suggested that it contributes to its angiolytic and antipsychotic effects. Sertraline has been suggested to have better therapeutic benefits in treating psychotic and delusional depression than other SSRIs out there. Similar to fluoxetine, sertraline is the only other SSRI with an active metabolite. Sertraline is metabolized to N-desmethylsertraline and a hydroxyketone. The half-life of sertraline is around 26 hours and the half-lives of its metabolites are around 48 to 72 hours. So not quite as long as fluoxetines. Now, what are some of sertraline's biggest benefits? Its main advantage is its safety profile. Sertraline is the SSRI of choice in those who have cardiac disease, in those who are pregnant, and in those who are breastfeeding. Study after study has demonstrated its low risk of causing cardiovascular problems compared to the other SSRIs. In addition, while SSRIs have been shown to cross the placenta and are present in breast milk, sertraline has been found to have the lowest concentration in breast milk compared to the other SSRIs, meaning that it's less likely to cause adverse effects in nursing infants. Another benefit is that it has few drug-drug interactions. The CYP enzymes aren't overly disrupted as long as the dose of sertraline is kept below 150 milligrams per day. Now, the main drawback that I hear the most about with sertraline is that it is the most likely to cause GI-related side effects. When I first started, I usually have to start low and go slow because of tolerability issues. Patients complain the most of nausea and loose stools. However, this typically resolves over time as your body gets used to the medication. Now on to SSRI number three, paroxetine, which is Paxil. I'm just gonna warn you, this is a medication that I have some strong opinions about, and I've already upset some people in my prior video about this medication. Ultimately, sorry not sorry though, okay? It's called straight talk psychiatry for a reason. 
What makes this medication the problem child of the SSRIs is its pharmacological profile. It is by far the dirtiest of them all. Look at all the receptors it hits. The general idea is the more receptors a medication hits, the more potential for side effects and tolerability issues. And that's exactly what we see clinically with this medication. So in addition to blocking serotonin reuptake, it has mild anticholinergic actions, weak norepinephrine reuptake inhibition, and inhibition of the enzyme nitric oxide synthetase. So let's break this all down. This medication used to be preferred by many doctors for the treatment of anxiety. It's different than fluoxetine and sertraline because it doesn't have those same activating properties that we talked about. Instead, it's actually thought to be more calming and even sedating in people because of the anticholinergic properties. However, when it comes down to it, paroxetine has failed to beat other SSRIs in around a dozen head-to-head -head trials in treating anxiety disorders. Its angiolytic effects are generally less than or equal to other SSRIs, and some even argue that it only has a modest benefit over placebo. What we see instead is a whole slew of problems from paroxetine's anticholinergic actions. Anticholinergic medications can cause things like dry eyes and blurred vision, dry mouth, constipation, urinary retention and confusion. This is a medication that I would never ever prescribe in children, pregnant women, or the elderly. And it's actually the only SSRI that has been linked to an increased dementia risk. Now let's talk about its weak norepinephrine reuptake inhibition. This is thought to help with its antidepressant effects. And something that's actually really interesting about this medication is that researchers have suggested that paroxetine at high doses, so generally 40 milligrams or more per day, may be as much, if not more, of a norepinephrine reuptake blocker than venlafaxine, also known as Effexor, right? And this is an SNRI medication, a completely different class of antidepressants that we commonly use. So that's kind of cool. Now onto the next pharmacological action of paroxetine, which is its ability to block the enzyme nitric oxide synthetase. This is something you're going to want to pay attention to. And this property is really important to keep in mind because it's believed to be the reason for the high incidence of sexual dysfunction seen with this medication. So men in particular, you're going to want to listen up here. Nitric oxide synthetase is an enzyme that plays a key role in the production of nitric oxide. And when paroxetine leads to less production of nitric oxide, it can lead to a decrease of blood flow in the penis, which is obviously very important in achieving and maintaining an erection. So what we see clinically is that those who take paroxetine often struggle with erection issues, decreased libido, and ejaculation problems. It's worth noting though, that not all patients experience sexual dysfunction with paroxetine, and it may vary depending on the individual's age, gender, and overall health. However, this side effect is more common with paroxetine compared to the other SSRIs, and it's important for you to discuss any concerns you have about sexual function with your healthcare provider. Now, another issue we see with paroxetine is that it's the SSRI with the shortest half-life, okay? It's under 20 hours, which means that it leaves the body relatively quickly. This makes paroxetine the SSRI that is the most likely to cause withdrawal reactions if you accidentally miss a dose or stop it too quickly. Withdrawal symptoms can include things like dizziness, nausea, insomnia, irritability, and other flu-like symptoms. Therefore, it needs to be tapered very slowly and gradually when you decide to come off of it. Then on top of all this, paroxetine has also been shown to lead to birth defects in pregnant women who take this medication. It has a high likelihood of causing weight gain, it has many drug-drug interactions, and it's the SSRI that has shown to increase the risk of suicide in children the most. So if you're wondering why I have such a strong negative opinion about this medication, you now hopefully have a better understanding. Let's hop over to SSRI number four, which is fluvoxamine, also known as Luvox. This medication was actually the first to be launched for the treatment of depression worldwide, but was never approved in the United States to treat depression. Instead, it's commonly used to treat OCD. As you can see, in addition to blocking serotonin reuptake, it also affects the sigma-1 receptors, like sertraline does. As mentioned before, the exact effects of this aren't well understood. It possibly helps with fluvoxamine's angiolytic properties, but ultimately, we don't know for sure. I don't have a whole lot to say about this medication. It's used less compared to the other SSRIs, and I don't prescribe it much, but there are two things I do want you to know about. The first is that this medication has a half-life that is under 20 hours, so similar to paroxetines, 
meaning that withdrawal issues can be common. The second is that it has a lot of drug-drug interactions. It's a potent inhibitor at CYP1A2, 3A4, 3A5, and 2C19. So lots of opportunities to interfere with other medications that you might be taking. Make sure to talk to your doctor if you're on this medication along with any others to see if there's any interactions to watch out for. SSRI number five is citalopram, which is Celexa. So this medication is interesting in that it's composed of two enantiomers. So to understand the concept of enantiomers, think of your left and right hands, right? They have the same number of fingers, nails, joints. They're mere images of each other, but they can't be superimposed. And this is similar to the two enantiomers of citalopram. They have the same molecular structure, but differ in their 3D arrangements. The two enantiomers of citalopram are called S-citalopram and R-citalopram. The S1 is the active ingredient that inhibits serotonin reuptake and provides the antidepressant effect. The R1 really doesn't have much significant activity on serotonin reuptake at all, but it does have some mild antihistamine properties, meaning that it might contribute to side effects such as sedation and sleep disturbances. Something that's noteworthy about this medication is that in 2011, the FDA put out a warning about its potential to increase the QT interval at doses higher than 40 milligrams per day. Now, the QT interval is essentially a measure of the time it takes for the heart to recharge between beats, and a prolonged QT interval can put a person at risk for a type of irregular heartbeat called torsades de points, which can be dangerous and even fatal. Now, the risk of this goes up as the dose of citalopram is increased. And it's important to know that CYP2C19 inhibitors like cimetidine can raise citalopram levels. Therefore, the FDA caps citalopram's dose at 20 milligrams per day for those who are over the age of 60, those who are poor metabolizers of CYP2C19, and those who are on medications that block CYP2C19. Now, what do we do for someone who needs to be on more than 20 milligrams per day of citalopram? Well, an option would be to switch them over to SSRI number six, which is s also known as Lexapro. So you know how I said the s enantiomer of citalopram is the active one that provides the antidepressant effects? Well, drug makers essentially took citalopram, chopped off the inactive R enantiomer, and created just the pure and active s citalopram. And then they weren't overly creative in coming up with a name for it. Get it right? s citalopram, s citalopram. Anyways, s is a purified S isomer and its serotonergic effects are 166 times more potent than the R isomer. It is the SSRI with pure serotonin reuptake inhibition, and it's thought to be the cleanest of them all from a pharmacological profile. So with removing the R isomer, s doesn't have the antihistamine properties that we see with citalopram. There's also no dose restrictions needed to prevent the QTC prolongation. And clinically, many believe that s is the best tolerated SSRI and the one with the fewest drug-drug interactions. Another thing that sets s apart is its FDA approval to treat depression and anxiety in children down to the age of 12. There's also evidence suggesting that s is better than the other antidepressants in treating severe depression. So if you're wondering which SSRIs are my favorite, I'd say my top three are fluoxetine, sertraline, and escitalopram. I prescribe these at a much higher rate than paroxetine, fluvoxamine, and citalopram. Now, if you're looking to do a deeper dive on any one of these SSRI medications in particular, I've created individual videos for each one of them that goes into more depth on things such as what they're approved to treat, commonly used dosing strategies, and other side effects to watch out for. So make sure to click the playlist on the top to check it out.